Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It's uh, November 30th, 2011, and Monica, hi there. <laughs> she, Monica's hey, joining I us. I have my cell phone. There we are. And we, we have lots of guests with us tonight, and we'll kind of let them introduce themselves. Um, I thought I thought things were um, becoming pairs, uh, if you know what I mean. Let me see if I turn that off. People are joining us. Um, we're going to be talking about open educational resources. We're going to be talking about lots of things. Um, and But we're going to focus on a course at the beginning here that Bud Hunt and Karen, were you involved in that too? So why don't we let Bud and... No. No, oh yeah, <laughs> yes you were. It was your fault. <laughs> I mean, oh, I mean no. your idea. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah. That's possible. All right. So in the announcement, I said that you facilitated the course and Karen coordinated it. How do you like that language? Anyway, um, we'll have to figure this out as we go here a little bit. Um, Bud, introduce yourself. Tell us uh, about. Um, the PDPU course you taught, and um, we have a few people who were in that course with you. Paul O is with us from the National Writing Project. Kevin Hodgins is with us. Um, Fred Haas, that's you up there, right? Welcome. Fred Haas is with us. Um, and I think you guys were involved in the class, the course. Chris Sloan is with us. Um, lots of people here. Um, and um, let me see, Harry. Harry Brake is with us as well. Uh, you know what, as you talk, introduce yourselves. I think it's going to take sort of too long to introduce everybody tonight. Um, and so let's get started. I uh, want to say there is a chat going on all over at edtechtalk.com slash live. And um, I get the names here. Scott Schilhart is uh, helping us bridge between the chat and... Um, <laughs> and the video here tonight so let's see what happens but the course ended about a month ago i think it was a six-week course it was a pdpu it was about common core and writing introduce yourself a little bit and then tell us what that was all about if you don't mind yeah sure uh so hi uh teachers teaching teachers uh, brady bunch edition i've never done one of these uh, massive, uh, uh, massive hangouts before. So I, I dig the, uh, the screens and the faces and everything. Um, so the, the PDP course was, um, uh, coordinated by Karen and, and some of her work. Uh, the, the idea was, um, uh, as I pitched it to her when we were talking about course design, um, a, a course on writing for people who aren't writing teachers. And we thought the common core was a good frame and, and, uh, the appropriate way to start. So, six weeks of open learning about um, Common Core and writing. And uh, along the way, the folks who ended up gravitating and sticking uh, with a lot of the course uh, were language arts teachers. So so the best laid plans. But uh, it was a neat opportunity to look specifically at the Common Core standards language and think about what that means for us as teachers of, of students and teachers of content and teachers of writing. And uh, because it was a peer to peer, it was largely um, uh, asynchronous, and then we did some, some synchronous uh, sessions, um, and it was it was just it was a neat opportunity to, to talk about writing and, and standards and stuff. He says, uh, knowing full well that there are folks in the room who might have very different takes on uh, whether it was neat or not. But that was the idea. Yep. Uh, Karen, can you talk a little more about P to P U? And in particular, I guess it's the um, edge, the school of ed. Yeah, school of ed. Thank you very much. And which which didn't exist when we started, right, Karen? Okay. I mean, you you sort of had an, an idea for a pilot, and I'm sorry to interrupt, Paul, but you had this idea for some pilot courses and and to see if, if it made sense, and and then along the way there was suddenly a school of ed in there. That's correct. And and my role in the writing course was to wrote Bud into this, which was fantastic. And then I, I was also a sort of lurking participant in that course and really, really enjoyed it. So um, 
P2PU, um, which is p2pu.org, um, is a sort of grassroots peer learning community um, that's based on open resources and peer learning. And we started um, a pilot for the School of Ed in September of this year, and we just um, finished the first round of seven courses. And we had a lot of fun with it. A lot of great people and interesting stuff going on. So let me focus on the word open for a second, because one of the things that we're doing is continuing a conversation that we started last week um, with Karen and with some others um, around the idea of open educational resources. Hi, Christina. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> Um, and Bud, I think you said it was an open course, and uh, do you guys want to take that word apart a little bit? What do you mean by open educational resources, open course, so, so forth? Yeah, well, um, in, in the case of peer-to-peer, of -peer, um, open means a bunch of different things, and I'll get the, I'll get the exactness uh, of this wrong, but you can go to p2pu.org and get the, the, the details. But um, open in this case meant anybody could show up. Open in this case meant... Um, to, to a large degree, anybody could sign up and open to this, uh, to this uh, in this situation meant anybody could follow along. So one of the really weird things about uh, a course of peer-to-peer -peer that I actually really like is um, anybody that wants to, if you set it up that way, can, can follow your course. So it, it's very open in the sense that you've almost got a, a fishbowl going on. You've got people that can watch and you've got people that can, can participate and the, the participants are, are engaging with each other um, but there are also a, a lot of lurkers. I think we had uh, two lurkers for every person who said they would enroll in the class, and even some of the folks who enrolled in the class. And in this case, enrolled meant you you clicked a button and filled out a, a questionnaire. Um, so, so many of those folks even were lurkers in the sense that they were not active contributors to conversations, either synchronous or asynchronous, but were, were just listening in and, and reading and, and thinking and in some cases, responding in their own uh, uh, spaces to what we were talking about, but in many cases, just uh, uh, paying attention, which which is different. And I kind of like it um, as a teacher or a facilitator. It was it was it was a, a new sense of open. Uh, and then the, the more traditional open piece of, of of some of the OER type of things. This was a mm -hmm. uh, an openly licensed course. All the materials are available for folks to reuse, do whatever they want to with. Um, hopefully, make better and then share back. <laughs> And uh, that's that's what we mean by open in this case. Karen, anything to add to that? Um, just to emphasize that all the courses and and groups and content that are that are published on P2PU are open licensed under a sharing copyright license, which means that anyone can republish them, redistribute them. I mean, you could take them and put them in your own LMS like Moodle. You could print them out. Um, and you can also go into any P2PU course and clone it and make your own version of the course. And that's kind of what drives the whole community is just a lot of people jumping in and um, helping facilitate, you know, whether or not they don't have to be an expert in the, in the topic, but to just get involved. So I want to invite and um, anybody here to jump in with any thoughts you have. I threw it to Bud first because he's shy and we wanted to get him uh, started. Uh, that's a joke. I, I didn't catch what you broke oh, up when you said whatever. Oh, but, I, I said uh, you're shy, so I wanted to get you talking. Oh, first. yes, yes, I, I am so but, shy. It's but, true. But feel free to jump in. Um, maybe people who were in the course uh, could talk about what your experience was like there. And I want to say that one of the questions I have I'm, I don't have language around this question yet, so I'm going to keep asking it in my awkward way, is, you know, you just mentioned that the materials are up there for people to take and to share, and, and I'm wondering if anybody has. So, so the potential of open educational resources, I think, goes way beyond the actual use that's going on out there in the community, and so... I want to ask about how, you know, we can be using each other's stuff more and better than we are, if that's a fair question as we go here. 
Right, so let me just throw it to the other guys. I think it was guys in this case who were in the course. Um, what was it like for you? Similar, different to other experiences? Um, Hi, I guess I'll try. This is Kevin Hodgson uh, First, out in Western Mass. Um, and I got involved in the course because I saw, I think I saw Bud somewhere um, on one of his posts uh, advertising it. So I thought it would be kind of interesting. Plus, our state is really immersed in the Common Core right now with uh, their own standards. And I think it was Fred Haas, too, who had written about uh, open courses somewhere, <laughs> Fred. And um, so I was interested in what he was up to. Um, and kind of all those things kind of helped me kind of walk towards it. And, you know, it was kind of fascinating to be part of it because it, the incentive was just personal incentive. Um, you know, you don't pay anything to get in, so there's no... Um, you're not leaving your, you know, the reward is kind of intrinsic, I think. And I think part of the things that we, we talked about the last session mm -hmm. was how to keep people involved, right, but at the very end there. Mm -hmm. um, and how to get the, the people who are lurking around maybe to get involved more in it. And I think it's a struggle that a lot of the open source or open kind of courses and, you know, even like our, you know, from the writing project standpoint of our site of how to get more people involved in, in different courses and classes and things is a struggle. But I found it really valuable, I should say, too. Yeah, and this is this is Paul O. At, um, I'm, I'm with the National Writing Project. Um, so I just wanted to uh, jump in because I was also involved in the course. And, um, you know, I was one of those people who uh, was involved and, um, you know, lurked for a little bit, actually missed the first couple of weeks. Um, so I appreciated the flexibility, uh, you know, that I think Bud was talking about earlier. Uh, that was great. Um, I, I think it was, uh, you know, it was a really valuable experience for me just because of, uh, you know, um, what people shared. And I would say in response to that question that you raised, um, Paul Allison, about what could be shared, um, you know, one of the things that um, Bud created in response to the Common Core um, framework was he shared a, a WordPress um, plugin in which, you know, he uploaded the, the uh, common core standards uh, related to writing. Um, and it was, it was, uh, it was something that we were then able to annotate. And, um, and it's something that, you know, Bud's willing to share, um, or all of us, I should say, you know, I mean, the Bud was the one who originated this, you know, that Bud's willing to share um, once the course is over. So that's one example, I would say. Um, and the other thing that I would just point out is um, one thing that I think is true with all these um, P2PU courses, um, or at, at least with the School of Ed courses that you know I was uh, following, um, is that there, um, you know, there was an opportunity for lots of people to be involved in you know this role of organizing the course um, and really taking leadership. So I think it was it was this really wonderful. Um, you know, best sort of, um, you know, practice with regard to w what does it mean to, you know, to lead a course like this? What does it mean to engage, you know, with others in the sharing of knowledge and the building of knowledge together? So, you know, Bud was the core organizer, but you know, I think he really invite, invited all of us, you know, to, to share that role with him. Yeah, that was, that was the attempt, and, and I appreciate you recognizing that. Um, the, the thing that was weird about this course was part of the thing that made it so neat was that it was so open. So I had no sense of, of who was there until we were there. And then it was a matter of, of to even be heard or understood or, or, or know that folks were there. They had to make their yarp, their barbaric yarp of some kind into the mess. And, and um, it, it, that's a different role for a student. I really like that idea of a student needing to take some sort of active role, but it's hard to know what all those uh, roles were. And, and I actually found myself holding back in terms of, um, I, I, in, in a lot of spaces where I've, I've had quiet students, I, I, would, I would jump on and try to elicit a lot of that feedback. But it was interesting here to sort of see what emerged. And uh, I, I learned a lot about, I think, how to facilitate these types of spaces. So, um, but, but definitely a different experience. And if you, if you haven't, uh, spent any time at peer-to-peer, -peer, I'd encourage you to take a peek. There's there's lots of neat stuff going on there. Um, 
one class in particular that, that folks in this in this group might be interested in is one called um, uh, uh, it's oh shoot I've gotten the name I've already butchered the name but it's hacking poetry there's a, a teacher uh, in, in or actually I don't know what she does for a living there, there it is for you and you actually know who I'm talking about Karen uh, uh, Vanessa I forget who is leading these really neat sort of working groups playing with poetry and, and both writing poetry and then reading poetry and, and just quick ins and outs for those types of courses, but also some really deep uh, programming types of stuff that I've, I've wandered in and out of. So to go back to your question, Paul, open means a lot of different things in peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's one of the neat and wonderful and, and creepy and exciting things about it. Hey, you know, and I would just also say that um, the, the course that Bud was, um, the course that Bud led was a um, was one that the National Writing Project, you know, the organization that I work for, you know, that um, the National Writing Project sponsored, mm -hmm. and uh, and that really is because you know we have this um, deep interest in you know many of what has been discussed so far, and you know I'm sure what will continue to be talked about you know over the course of this um, teachers teaching teachers webcast, but you know that is. Um, sharing resources, uh, open educational resources, this idea of um, writing and what does it mean to write today. Um, you know, so I think uh, on, on many levels, uh, this course that Bud led and constructed you know, is really um, very much sympathetic to what we at the National Writing Project believe too. So put, putting in that plug for the NW. Yeah, quite right. I mean, I, I, they were, they were uh, the, the project co-developed the course, I mean, and, and, and I hope that shows in some of the resources that were made available uh, on the space, but uh, that was a very handy relationship for a bunch of reasons. And Christina, one of the reasons we asked you to come tonight is that you're thinking of doing a peer, uh, a peer to peer university course as well. Is that true? Or what are some of your well, thoughts or questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I uh, have been talking to various people, so um, in conversations with Bud and with Paul, um, thinking about, and then also just the other day with you when you were thinking about, you've been asking about how do you, you know, there's all these resources, but then how do you create dialogue between mm -hmm. these resources? Um, and, you know, Bud did a really beautiful job of sort of using really a bunch of diverse resources as well as creating new resources in the course. Um, and um, when I was thinking about the Digital Is website, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's all these deep and really interesting resources in that website. And there's some discussion happening, but how can we have, you know, greater engagement around those rich resources that are being developed? Um, and, you know, the places that we see really deep engagement with the resources are often in study groups at local sites. So a local site is doing some sort of study group or an inquiry group around digital literacies work. And then they use digital is as a sort of drafting, writing, sharing forum, you know, so people in draft mode can give each other feedback. And the inquiry and study group gives each other feedback in the space. And then when they're at the sort of conclusion of their project, one of the things they do at the conclusion of their project is go public with their resources. So thinking about that and how robust some of those study groups have used the website as a sort of writing, drafting response forum, and then as then ultimately as a publishing forum, um, as well as using digitalism as a text, this idea of, you know, maybe using, having a sort of course at PDPU that's, you know, a study group kind of focus around digital literacies work and you do a similar thing. You sort of do an on, uh, inquiry into your work and you start to pull that together in some, and then you're working with a group. So kind of using the different forums for their different strengths and um, supporting what I think um, could be some interesting dialogue between the resources. So that was one idea that's emerged. There are a couple others too, but I, I'll just stop because I, it's, what I'm excited about being here tonight is just even having a chance to talk with you all about some of these ideas. Like how could we 
do some of this stuff? Like, what, what would be really interesting and vibrant to do? And I was going to point to two people at this point. Um, one is to Karen and the School of Ed. And should we be thinking about doing these courses in the School of Ed? And is the School of Ed going to continue? Those kinds of questions. But I also wanted to get Fred into the mix here a little bit because Fred Haas, you've talked for uh, over a year now about thinking about uh, Dave Cormier's idea of MOOCs and you know so forth, somehow accessing all that material in digital is. Um, so maybe you could float that idea. So whoever wants to talk first, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. Karen. <laughs> We're having a. Um... A discussion in the chat room oh, about Tell us the about merits yeah. of formal credit options. Somebody asked if uh, the School of Ed was modeled after traditional schools of ed. And I said, honestly, no. I was roped into using that as a marketing term hmm. um, and, and really wrote a whole series of blog posts at the very beginning about, at, of this about formal education versus sort of do-it-yourself education, which is very much what P2PU is. Um, but we looked at, you know, we, we went through a process of exploring um, get, doing formal university credit for these courses and, you know, ran up to kind of the, all the issues that you have with the university, formal qualifications of, you know, what they would call professors or instructors and what we call facilitators and even just the role of what does it mean to have a course that's facilitated by somebody who may or may not be an expert in the subject area. And I would say in the, in the pilot of the School of Ed, we had people who, were, who did have a lot of expertise. Um, but even in a peer learning model, what are the pros and cons of having somebody who's sort of an expert in, the, in their field and does that stifle peer learning? And then just a lot of other issues about things like having a fixed syllabus and, and you know, most universities do credit by seat time and what does seat time look like online and is that really what's important? Um, and just, you know, a hundred other issues where I think formal education in a lot of ways just is antithetical to peer learning. Um, and then we got into a whole big, you know, do, obviously it's important to teachers to be able to get credit um, and it, depending what state you're in, you know, there's 49 different kinds of credit. Um, and did we want to, you know, did we want to make those compromises? And I think we decided um, really early on, um, and I, I would credit um, Philip Schmidt, who's the founder of P2PU, of really saying, you know, don't compromise what you think is the right thing to do in terms of peer learning in order to get formal credit. But that's something that on an ongoing basis, you know, we're going to continue to wrestle with because I think it is important um, for teachers to be able to get credit, whatever that means in their district or state. And I think there's a lot of flexibility. You know, there are, there are a lot of people sort of working on these issues, um, but it's definitely something that has, has been interesting. Well, and I was saying in the chat, I thought it was kind of nice to not have to worry about uh, credit and golly did folks finish and 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 what did that look like and, and did I check that off appropriately but but just today uh, Karen and I got an email from somebody in the course saying hey can I get a certificate of completion for this course because I'd like to turn it in for credit um, so so I mean this whole process if it, if it does anything um, building a course in a space like peer-to-peer -peer causes you to ask some really important questions about well what counts as learning and and what is a course um, is it the syllabus of, of activities? Is it the people who interact with them? Um, we almost had two courses. We had sort of this, it, it, the, every week we had a live meeting and we had a lot of people who came to those and that was their course experience. And we had a lot of people who came to the, uh, came to the course materials and just, just conversed and interacted electronically and asynchronously. Which one of them had, a, had the experience of the course? Um, which ones of them didn't? I mean, those are really, I, I don't know, I guess they're silly questions in some ways, but in other ways, I think they're really interesting questions. Uh, and, and when it comes to peer learning, you know, what counts and, and what doesn't? I noticed on, um, I think it was Change Mook, 
that people are getting credit from universe, uh, you know, in some credentialing, at some credentialing thing, and then, you know, using the MOOC as, as the forum in which they're learning. Um, and I'm wondering if, I mean, I imagine that's probably happening to a certain extent with P2PU in some places, um, that, um, you know, it's kind of an opportunity for people then to sort of tie it to other coursework and stuff too. So I just wonder if that stuff's happening. Or if you well, know of anybody doing that. We explored it in our district. Our Office yeah. of Professional Development basically lets anybody pitch, you know, here's this experience I had, does it count? Yeah. And and let it go through that peer review process, or not peer review, there's somebody in the office who says, aha, that was learning, or aha, that wasn't. Uh, right, and, uh, right. So it's someone yeah. else's, yeah. And we, we and went it, through that in our in our district, and it was, it was considered uh, appropriate for folks to go after. So mm -hmm. Great. Did that have... I think it's state by state, too. Like in New York... You know, it's district decision, but there are a lot of states that it has to be not only university CEUs, but actually university grad credits, and it's just it varies all over the place. Mm -hmm. But oh yeah, and, and even within there, everybody knows. I'm sorry, Paul, but everybody knows the university in the state that will count your experience for credit if you give them either the right amount of money or you write it up the right way or you know the right person. I mean, <laughs> right. And, and that's that's you know in this new space. There's a lot of old problems in the old spaces, but uh, there's there's some room to play. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Paul, I interrupted you. Yeah, I was, was going to ask, well, you decided to do a six-week course. Did the accreditation impact on that decision, or how did you decide how long the course was going to be? Um, Karen the said that they should be about six weeks. <laughs> that was, um, that was Karen. Okay. No, so, so yeah, that was sort of a school of ed uh, requirement. But but if I understand right, Karen, <laughs> the, yeah. the conversation and, and and this is this is I found to be true in online situations. The longer you stretch an online voluntary experience, um, the the higher the drop off. I feel like I can talk with my hands since we're all hanging out here. Yeah, we got um, the the higher the drop off. I mean, you just you you uh, you lose people the longer it goes. So. Um, maybe you could talk more about that, Karen, but I got the sense that that felt like a magic time frame. Well, in hindsight, and, and in the next <laughs> round, we will probably do it differently. Yeah. But, I mean, honestly, the six-week time frame was a compromise, which I, we probably shouldn't have made, but it was a compromise of a length of time we thought it was, it was the – Longest we thought we could keep people around and engaged and the shortest we thought we could do credit for and I think we would I, I would do it differently next time uh, one of the things we've talked about for next time is doing some very um, Short highly discussion driven Engaging courses with a with probably with a lot more people because another thing we did is initially we capped them at about 30 ish depending on the course um, we're looking at a model in the future, at least to try, and I think P2PU is kind of a learning lab where it's about trying different things, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, but what we've talked about is doing some really short, like a week or two, highly engaging courses with, with maybe a lot of people, like a hundred, and then have some deeper, longer experiences with a smaller group that's, that's committed to some kind of common goal, like building something. Um, spin off of those groups and that that might be interesting but I think you know we're interested in trying different things so in the chat room there's a question that Peggy asked about do you need to cap enrollment if you're not giving credit the reason again I don't I think I would do this every time I do a course on P2PU I go I'm gonna do it totally differently next time but the, the reason to cap it at the time was as a facilitator it's and, and as a member of a course it's very hard to be engaged in a personal way with people when there's 200 people in the course, to me. Um, so we decided to cap it to sort of get more, you know, to be able to have more personal connections. But I think the other thing is, and this was also a conversation in the chat room about people lurking, you know, of 30 people, in most of the courses in our pilot, in the first week, and even the week before the course started, and then the first week, 30 people were active, but by week two or three, it dropped to half, and by the end, it dropped to less than half. So that was sort of the thinking of maybe we start with 100 people, and then at the end, we have 20. 
I mean, I think it depends on the course and what's going on in people's lives. It, what was interesting in the chat room was Peggy was saying, um, you know, she lurks and it's not that she's not engaged. She's there. It's just, mm -hmm. it's what she's doing. And she's, you know, she's, she's not an uh, early person to this area. I mean, she has a doctorate and lots of experience in online learning. And that's just, that's where her time is right now. And I was saying, you know, we always, Bud and I have talked about this, hearing from people who we haven't heard from in the whole course. And you think people are just MIA somewhere. And then somebody emails or calls or we do a Skype and they go, this totally changed my whole classroom. And, you know, as a facilitator, I'm like, really? Where were you? But, you know, you forget that if you don't hear from people, it doesn't mean that they're not there and engaged. And that's just, I mean, I don't know how you gauge that, but it's, a re it's really interesting. Uh, I want to jump in for a sec. I just want to go back to this um, credit issue. Um, okay, I'll know. jump in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, okay, I... Paul, we'll, we'll go back. Go ahead, Fred. Go ahead. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, Fred. Uh, okay, well, I mean, I, it's fascinating listening to this conversation for a couple of reasons. I mean, one of the things, um, like you said, it was a little over a year ago, I was really sort of kind of pitching the idea of that MOOC with... Um, some NWP folks and and I mean I think it might have been a little bit ahead of the curve at the time but um, what's fascinating with all this discussion about credit though is that in the um, the MOOC spaces that you know Dave Cormier and Stephen Downs and um, and the and the like have been and Siemens that they've been doing what they've done in each of their sort of iterations is they they've actually migrated further and further away from credit at a single university. I mean, it started out like that, but this current one that they're doing, it's not affiliated with the university at all. And, um, and I, I mean, I think one of the things that was really interesting about the, about the class that Bud did and the sort of peer to peer model is that it's, there's some advantages to having things sort of warehoused in a single place, as opposed to, um, the sort of distributed kinds of uh, systems and resources that are at play in a lot of the, um, the sort of early MOOC work. Um, and there's always like this tension between those two things, um, which I, I find to be actually a, a really interesting sort of um, problem area, I guess. I, I don't know that that's the best way to term it, but that's kind of what it is. And um, so, I don't know about the credit thing. I, personally, I, I kind of feel like, you know, there's a sort of intrinsic motivation for anybody that's going to even begin to think about doing these things because, yeah, they're open, but there's a lot of people that don't even really know about them. So um, I, I kind of feel like, you know, the wheelhouse is in, like, really hardcore, dedicated people. So um, set things up to serve them and then just, like, always keep an open invitation um, to anybody else that would like to join because people do kind of drop in and drop out and they kind of take what they need at the given time and of course life gets in the way and and it's you know it's free so people feel a little bit more liberation and how they participate I think um, but ultimately I think the thing that's most compelling to me with regards to the writing project was um, you know, we have like the E anthology and then Kevin and Bonnie have created the I anthology that sort of goes all year round and, um, but that's really successful in the summer. And I just feel like, um, you know, some kind of advanced sort of inquiry, um, where there's this invitation to be part of this sort of, you know, relatively larger community. Um, but there's some guidance, you know, you have some guides. Uh, that are sort of co maybe co-learners more than they are even facilitators. Um, but they just are more familiar with some of the stuff than just the everyday person. And so um, they're really the, the, the people that are kind of steering the ship a little bit. And that's really kind of the thing that I was most um, amped up for when I started kind of talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh I think I'm interrupting Harry's typing there, but Harry, Harry, introduce oh, yourself. Yes. It's first time you're on the show, yes. and we've been really rude to you. Um, <laughs> letting you no, you're not that. rude. Uh, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, but, I'm listening, and I'm getting ideas. So, but introduce yourself yeah, and yeah. tell us some of your <laughs> ideas. 
Okay. Um, my name's Harry. Um, I moved from the United States to Mexico City. Um, my big motivation was I just was tired of teaching somewhere where the state tests were the focus, so I'm like, I'm out of here. So when I went to Mexico, then um, I was able to use a lot of my knowledge that I had learned, um, you know, for just the, the sky's the limit pretty much as far as, the, you know, the state testing is not really a topic. But I'm in a school where there's uh, students that come from all over the world. And it's the only, it's the longest um, it's the oldest American school in all of Mexico, so it's kind of an interesting blend. You have a lot of bilingual students there, but the thing was when I I didn't know anything about PTPU, and I just kind of hung along with some things that uh, Karen had done because she had come to our school in Delaware when I was teaching there. Just happened one day to come across PT. I think she actually maybe maybe mentioned something to me about it. And I thought, oh, if Karen's in it, it's got to be good. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do it. And then I didn't know anything about nano. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll do that. So I did it at the same time. And so I was doing this 50,000-word thing, you know, in the month of November. And then I was doing PTPU. And uh, I didn't know exactly what I got myself into. But the cool thing was, you know, I jumped into it blindly. And my uh, the person that's in charge of professional development at our school, um, her big thing is that, you know, we have no professional development because the school's behind on things like AP or IB requirements. So they now make their professional development catching up with that. And there's nothing really outside of that for, stu uh, for teachers. She said, I just need you to find something that would help other teachers with the 21st century technology. And there was a class, uh, 2.0 tools. So it what I mean, just what Karen said, I jumped in, I thought this would be really good because I can take what I learned and bring it back to my school. And at the time when I joined, there was ever... 55 maybe I mean it looked like 55 people between people that were just lurking and people that wanted to join and then at the end of it there was eight so you know we had this project and we were supposed to do electronic toolkit and we were, had groups of three for each page and then the two people that were in my group they just pretty much disappeared you know and I was the only one doing my section and I'm, I'm thinking in the back of my mind this was kind of like when I was in college and everybody said oh it's great to be in a group but then you only have two or three people that are doing it but the great thing was, I mean, Chris and um, Ann Batchelder were in charge of it. Even though people dropped out, uh, there were still other people that had finished their project early that would come over and be willing to help. So it was interesting to see how people would overlap and compensate. So you might start out with a large number, but between that and then my students, I'm, I'm in a lab, I'm, I used to teach for 12 years English, but then I moved to the librarian position in Mexico. And I have cadets, you know, students that are just working and they, you know, don't really have much to do. So then I ended up bringing them over to the screen when I was doing the PTPU courses and the kids started doing some of the assignments with me and they got really into it and they're like, I got a really good idea for this lesson plan. So ended up being my students and me doing, they, they took the role of the two teachers that were absent, you know, or the two members that were supposed to be in my group. And once they were really involved in it, they were really excited. I mean, they, they were, they were, we're talking like 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, but they came up with a lot of the ideas for putting things on this toolkit. The ultimate, the end product was a toolkit and that can go out to teachers anytime they want 15, 20 resources they can use in the room, they can go there. But a lot of the ideas came from students that were in a classroom saying, you know what, I think you could add this and this and the class would be a lot more interesting. So it was really interesting having the kids participate in it. It made a big difference. It helped me out a lot too. And I mean, overall, that my my boss, who is the head librarian, she's taking a four credit masters at Endicott, and she didn't even get half of what I got out of it in a six week course. She's mm -hmm. sitting beside me and seeing me doing my PTPU stuff with the kids huddled around me doing it. She's doing it alone, and she's two out of eight people that really haven't even done anything. There, all the other people in the class, same thing, are behind. But she's like, are you getting paid for this? Or are you getting credit for this? You know, and then after a while, those questions stopped. And she's like, well, you have this, this, and this as resources of things that you didn't even have before you started this class. And I mean, I proofed a lot of her papers, you know, before she submitted them. And all she was doing was just simple rhetoric. There was nothing other than just responding to a text, turning into a teacher. Teacher was checking it coming back with mistakes and that was it and that was about as much interaction as she was getting but was she and getting on credit? my end of it you know i had my students involved and i was getting sources i've never used before and uh -huh. so despite the fact that people were dropping out i had the support from the people that were running the course and then it gave my kids ideas and they want to do a course you know i mean they want to help co-teach a course on like creative writing you know and the kids want to 
they're doing a uh, literary magazine. So that's their key. They see this as being an opening to promoting a literary magazine that will go to all parts of the country. You know, the kids from Israel that come, kids from uh, Russia that come, from Mexico, obviously, Latin America, Chile. They want to use a class that will be a portal to all these different countries. And they're like, wow, we can really make our class international. So I think and Karen was asking me, we were just at NCT, and she said, how do you keep people in the class so that they stay with a commitment that they make early on without dropping out? And the kids were the one that gave me the idea. They said, well, why don't you pair up one of the teachers with one of us? And if there's a teacher or somebody that's in the class that's paired up with a student to do a project, they're probably a little less likely to drop out of the course, um, you know, instead of, you know, well, I, you know, things get in the way, I got to go. But if they're paired up and depending on another student, the students seem to think, and I thought that was a pretty good idea, that the student and participant together, if they could, I mean, virtually, they could pair up with somebody from Mexico and it could be somebody from Iowa and they could be doing a project together because with the media that we have, they can do that. But so there's all these different possibilities. So, Harry? you know, I, I felt for the very beginning, I was behind the wheel a lot, Harry, but yeah. One second. it worked out. I mean, <laughs> good. Yeah. Harry, let's, let's, um, let's get Paul O back. He was very patient. Yeah. He had an idea earlier about accreditation. Do you want yeah, to sure. try to go to that for a second, Paul? And then, I mean, I, sure. I'm at yeah. least hearing the same question over and over, which has to do with how do we keep people involved? But I want to ask, why do we care? Um, and I want to ask that in a very serious way. Um, but Paul, accreditation, if you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is just going back to an earlier part of the conversation, mm -hmm. so we can, you know, um, move past this. Uh, but let me just first of all mm -hmm. say that, you know, the angle um, the, the, of the camera angle for Fred, to me, makes it look like, you know, the stuff behind you is going to fall in your head. So <laughs> watch out, Fred. And um, I was uh, going to say that, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I was really glad to not have to be thinking about credit um, in the course. Uh, you know, like I was traveling for the first couple of weeks or the first week of Bud's course, and I remember, you know, writing him an email and being like fearful in the way that, you know, a student who's worried that he's going to fail the class, you know, um, sends the email. And, uh, you know, and of course, Bud's response was, you know, you should enter the course when you can. And, you know, um, it's, I mean, it, that, that, was the, that was the ethos, um, you know, and the culture of the course. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's true, of, you know, all PPU courses. Uh, so I'm not, um, you know, and I, and I understand uh, valuing, um, you know, intrinsic reasons for learning. I, I the, the thing that I think about, though, um, is if I were a teacher, um, you know, and I used to be a teacher, and I was approaching this course, I mean, you know, the, the culture is that, um, you know, as a teacher, you receive credit for um, engaging in things that are called courses, you know, mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's, it's like the discourse that exists. And I'm not saying that it's the right, you know, language to use, or it's, the, you know, that should be the motivation. But I, but I think that there is a disconnect in a way, you know, between what a teacher's expectation is because everything else, you know, in the world that they generally face um, when they're trying to, you know, make more money or, you know, um, move up in whatever way the teachers can, you know, involves them having to have credit, you know, and, and showing this to their district administrators. So in some senses, it's like, yes, the system is flawed, but how do we help teachers, you know, get to this point where, um, you know, taking a P to PU course, it, um, you know, that they understand the meaning of that, and you know, and they can get beyond this fact that well, they're not going to get credit. You know. Or like, do we have to think about some way to provide a kind of credit that would support them? Um, you know, that is different, that doesn't fall into you know all the pitfalls that we know is true that was described over the course of you know our conversation tonight. So that's what I was going to say. I mean, it's, you know, to me, it feels like a quandary a little bit. Bud, what are you thinking? <laughs> well, I think it certainly is. I mean, I, I just said in the chat room that um, to, to Monica, I wonder what, you know, like a detox uh, a PD uh, looks like, you know, or PD detox looks like, because I think that's really applicable. I mean, there's, there's a lot of habits and, and mindsets and, and culture that says, that the class will begin at 4.15 and it will end at 6.15 and that I will tell you something to do and you will do it. 
And I mean, a lot of the things that I think we want to happen in our in our classrooms with students is is baggage uh, that that we probably should want to have happen with teachers. So, or, let me say that the other way around. There's a lot of bad practice in both the place where the students learn and the place where the teachers learn. And I wish that we were um, fiddling in both of those places more. So, um, I, I certainly think there's there is a tension between hey, let's have a free and open experience and, and come in whenever and and go and and this this monumental, almost monolithic culture that says, well, there are ways that we do things and this is how we've done them. And I think uh, spaces like P2P are really great for exploration. Um, one of the struggles, though, is that, that folks are, are not necessarily willing to give the little bit of time that they have for that experimentation all the time if they can't end up with some sort of, of, of thing to show for it or that, that new experience can supplant the old one. So. Um, I, I just love the, the environment of, of P2P. I'm thinking about what I want to do there next. I'd love to, to play in all the, all the other spaces uh, that you guys are in. Um, f forgive me, guys. I'm going to have to slip away. I've got to go and, and play a carpool dad for my kids. But I look forward to hearing the, <laughs> the rest of the conversation. And, and I, I really um, Thank you, appreciate the time on the topic. Tonight. Can I ask you one more quick question? Sorry. Oh, of course. Yeah, of course. Did, were you playing? Did you make something? I mean, that's been mentioned a couple of times that that's what keeps people together is when they're making something together. Was there some thought about that in your course? Yeah, yeah, there was. And, and when I came into it, I knew exactly what we were going to make. And, and, and as we started working together, I changed uh, that a little bit. And I asked folks to be making stuff. Um, but, but one thing I, 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 I didn't necessarily do is make us make something together. We had places to talk together. We had places to interact together, um, but but the made thing didn't didn't work out so much. Um, I think that's that's one of the reasons why Karen um, it, it, Karen and I've talked about like this like let's let's talk for a while and then let's figure out what we want to build as a learning experience. Uh, that's an idea that we're experimenting with in some PDM doing here in Colorado that that is sort of open and 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 for lack of a better word nebulous as as to what we might do. Um, but but I, I do think the building and making is important. Um, that said, I don't know how lurkers make and build, and I think there really is something to this lurker experience that I don't um, I don't know how to manage uh, a lurker experience. But it seems like that's an important experience for some people, and and I don't know how you make something as a lurker. Good question. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. So if y'all go ahead and solve that in the next 10, 12 minutes, I'll listen sure. to the podcast. And <laughs> no problem. I'll be good to go. <laughs> Thanks, bud. <laughs> yeah, take care, everybody. Rock on. Thanks, bud. Thanks. Who wants to jump in? Karen, maybe uh, what, what have you been thinking? I'm wondering, um, like, is there room for students to do peer-to-peer -peer you? Um, and what other issues have been coming up here? Maybe you could bring us back a little bit. Sure. I mean, I think Harry's idea of um, teaming a student and teacher teams and doing a course together, I think is just a totally awesome idea. That was one of the things I left Chicago being most excited about. So that's something we definitely want to pursue. Um, and I think, you know, we would love to have students involved at P2PU. It, because of the whole internet, SEPA, COPA, whatever, it needs to be mm -hmm. over 13 right now. So, and, nice. you know, yeah. maybe that could be worked out down the road. But I think, you know, within that, there's a lot of room to do some exciting things. Um, and where we are right now is we're just... We have just finished the pilot phase, and we are brainstorming the next round of courses and plan to have some new things up and going probably February-ish. And, you know, again, I said this last week, but I would invite anybody on this webinar or anybody, anybody to jump in and participate in facilitating a course or suggesting a course title or being a part of a course. Um, one of the things that that we also want to do is do some some hybrid things next year where we have some schools who are participating um, with us a face-to-face -face cadre and then a bigger group doing it online and I just um, I just talked to a school um, Harry actually I talked to Todd about this 
Oh, and yeah, yeah. we're talking about maybe do, looking at something for um, elementary and higher order thinking skills. Um, but I think, you know, the, the range of courses and things we could do is just only limited by anybody's imagination. So I'm, you know, I'm eager to hear people's ideas and to have people jump in and get involved. Karen, can I ask um, ahead, Chris, a couple things? So, um, to, to propose something, do you suggest we do it through the, um, you know, suggest a course thing on P to PU, or how best if it's supposed to be framed within the School of Ed? Well, I mean the, the, so I'll sort of tell you the bigger P to PU thing, and then we could talk about School of Ed. But I mean, at P to PU as a whole. There's a big button on the main page that says contribute and you just go click the button and you make yeah. a course and right. it's really I mean it's it's P2PU is open in a way that I would say is unlike anything I've ever done before because literally just anybody jumps on it makes a course and that's the way that you know 95% of the things at P2PU work right. now the school of ed we we had a much more um, I guess a much more traditional approach. This is another thing I maybe regret, but um, part of that is because we did have um, some outside funding, um, and we we did we wanted we kind of had a vision of what we wanted to put together as a model for the first offering. So I would say the sort of expertise level of the people who put courses together in the first run was, um, you know, unlike anything that P2PU had ever done. And I again, I think there were pros and cons to that. I mean, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's totally fabulous to have people like Bud involved. Um, but, you yeah. know, so I would say within the School of Ed, whatever is com comfortable for you. If you want to okay. jump in and just make a course, that's great. If you want to um, pass some ideas around and, and talk about it, um, that's fine too. I think, you know, we were really excited about the partnership with National Writing Project and, you know, anything anybody in National Writing Project wanted to do, I think we were really excited about. Well, I was thinking that, um, you know, both this sort of hybrid model that you talked about, um, I, you know, I imagine, I, I don't know, I think that people would be interested in various levels, but writing projects do run things, professional development, courses, workshops, seminars, you know, so it, there might be some uh, folks that would be interested in doing, uh, having that kind of connection or playing with that kind of connection, I could imagine. That would be um, awesome. And I would also say that, um, you know, the courses we did for School of Ed for the pilot were very, um, they were courses. I mean, they had a start date and an end date and they had a syllabus, which was another thing we sort of did for the credit thing. And I don't know, some of us did very formal syllabuses and some of us, like I would say, Buds was sort of less formal. Um, but we could, I mean, somebody could do a National Writing Project, just a group. So when you mm -hmm. go create a thing, whatever you call the entity at P2PU, you can choose to have it be a course, but you can choose to have it be a group. You can ha choose to have it be a challenge. They're doing a lot with challenge sort of driven things. Or you can call it anything you want. So um, Harry was a part of a really fun group we did on NaNoWriMo, for those of you who know. And right. Harry finished yesterday. Yay! Um, oh, my God. I got more gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah. But for that one, we just called it a writing group. And it was very, we did a prep group, and then we did a, a group for November. But it was, it was much less, I mean, obviously, there was no, you know, the one for November, the the thing was just go right and if you need support or we just kind of checked in right. on each other and said support, support and that kind of thing right exactly yeah. so but i mean it could be just a wide range of different things the Another funny thing is when oh go ahead sorry go ahead that's okay go ahead harry i was just going to say when the kids found out that teachers were doing the nano and then when they found out that i was a teacher and i was doing nano and then it was just funny because they wanted to participate they're like if you're doing it and i'm doing it and that's how the kids came into the PTPU. You know, they were just like, what are you doing? And then they started getting involved in it. And it was funny giving them a little taste of it. Really, they wanted to run rampant with it. They had so many ideas. But it was just, to them, it was something totally different than being stuck in a classroom with a guy lecturing at them. And they liked that interaction where they're like, well, it's kind of cool. I'm sitting beside you, but I'm talking to people from the United States. And, I mean, they loved that whole concept. And I think there's a thread there 
you know, that it would be interesting to have that component. I think it would make an added component to the whole, you know, um, idea of, okay, am I going to get credit for it? But sometimes that drops away when, you know, the teachers are able to talk to somebody if their class is doing a unit on Latin America. How appropriate is that if you just kind of stumble across a class on PTP where you can talk to other teachers and other students? And it's a little bit better in Skype because it's more one-on-one uh, -on -one or there's two groups on two groups or whatever. But, I mean, it was just, even with Nano and PTP, you could see with the student element added in, it was a completely different ball game as far as them being interested, you know. And then it got the teachers interested. So I just, I like that idea of what the students being involved somehow because it changed, you know, kind of the outcomes a little bit of what would happen when we came up with an end product, you know, of a toolkit. Some of that we gave credit to some of the students because it was some of their ideas, you know, too. And that was really neat. So. Chris Sloan, uh, what have you been thinking? <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. Well, I mean, uh, you I, I talked earlier about how... Um... Yeah. yeah, we can hear can you. Can you hear me? me? Yep, good. Yeah. Uh, I talked earlier about how, um, you know, this changing notion of students and, and teachers and, and teachers as students and students as teachers, which, you know, definitely appeals to a lot of the work that I do just in my traditional classroom. But I mean, lately I've been thinking about, and I think Fred and Christina and Kevin have too, is the idea of, you know, what is professional development? And, um, you know, we struggle with that locally. That's, we are bound by time and space in our traditional notions of professional development. And, uh, but there's a real need, like when teachers get together and they talk about, you know, teaching and learning, there's this upswell of, man, I wish we could do this more often. So I guess my question to Karen is, how open is open? Like, what's your protocol for, um, you know, just an ad hoc group of uh, yeah, I mean, professionals? It's totally open. I mean, in, in five seconds, you can go to PDPU and set up a group to do anything you want. And it's pretty, I mean, it's way open. If you just scan the courses in PDPU, you'll get a flavor for how open it is. I mean. This is way all over the board in terms of content and structure and just everything. So I want to, um, we need to end here. I, I want to get back to a question and I wanted to ask peer-to-peer um, -peer you this question. Why do you guys care if there's fall off? Why do you want people to stay involved? And then I, and beyond accreditation, I mean, there's all that conversation, but I think there's a there are bigger reasons than that. Okay. Well, I mean, I can say for myself as a facilitator, mm -hmm. it, it's just about personal, I don't say personal gratification. I mean, mm -hmm. and most of P2PU is it's run by volunteers, and I mean, it may be a mindset. You know, I would definitely say like. I've been working with P2PU a little over a year, and the, my first course was probably the hardest, but the most exciting too, because the, the things that were different were really cool. But I would say as a traditional teacher, just if you have 50 people who have signed up, and you, you have to, to be a participant in P2PU, you actually have to write a, like a sign-up task, and we, we've done pretty extensive ones. Some of the ones on P2PU are really light. But I mean, we had people who wrote like five pages about why they want to be in the course and all what they were going to do and the projects because we also asked them to set their own goals and sort of design their own, you know, take the act the syllabus or whatever. And when a lot of those people just then they do that work to get in and they could have opted to follow, but then they're just gone. I sound like I'm being kind of whining about this, but yeah. I mean, this gives you my perspective. It, it's, I think to me, some of it is just wanting to know like, you know, our people, like Peggy was saying, she, she does stuff like this and she follows and she's there and she gets benefit. And I definitely had people who contacted me and said, you know, we're, even though we're not posting or we're not doing the activities, we're here and we're getting benefit. But I think, you know, it, it's a lot of work to put together something and mm -hmm. you want to think people are getting benefit. And I, I think a natural response to a big fall off is, you know, people aren't staying engaged or they're not getting benefit, especially when in the first couple of weeks, the engagement is so high and it's like so exciting. And then, you know, week five is like, where is everybody? So, I mean, I don't think, I, and I would say P2PU as a, 
it, they're, they're really, it's a very informal sort of group and it's really small. So I, I couldn't even say as an institution because they're not really an institution. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't think as a group, I don't know that there's a strong yeah. feeling like we need to have 50% active or whatever. But I, I would say for myself as a, as somebody who's pretty involved in it, it's, that's sort of the I think background. That was a very thoughtful and personal answer. I appreciate it. <laughs> and, and I just, I don't, I don't want that question of how do we get more people involved in this stuff to only go to accreditation questions. So that was that was a helpful thing to, there to say there. Um, we're over time here, but uh, if you've been waiting to say something, please speak up now. <laughs> Who'd like to say something here <laughs> at the end? Kevin, you've been waiting a lot. Do you want to say something or up to you? I, I think that Harry's idea of the student, uh, you know, teacher partnerships is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of engaging t uh, teachers, which is what we're talking about here, uh, in a meaningful project, I mean, I agree, that would keep them engaged. So mm -hmm. cool. that's something that somebody should pursue, I think. Anybody else? I just, yeah, I just, the only reason why I keep on going back to the student thing is because that seems to energize the teachers again. And that's what kept on, you know, coming to me back. And when I saw how excited they were, and they were just excited over something that really wasn't even meant, designed, I don't think, to be for students. But when they saw that they had an impact, it made a big difference on everybody else around them. So I think that that's the reason why I keep on coming back to that. I, it was amazing to see how energized they were by that. So if it would help a course or help other teachers and help them see, well, look, you know, you're no longer the lecturer or the sage on the stage, you know, I mean, you're like part of the class. So just like the students, and that gives them a little bit more empowerment. The whole uh, tone of the class changes a little bit. So. Mm -hmm. Paul, I, Christina. I, go ahead, Christina. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Christina. Me? Okay. Um, well, I just want to say that I'm really excited about the potential of some of the partnerships and some of the work that I think could sort of come together. Um, uh, between some of the different forums we all have. So even mm. this Hangout and then, you know, P2PU and then Digital Is and what are all these amazing resources that are sort of circulating between all these different sites and then how do we kind of keep engaging around them, I think is really exciting. And, um, mm -hmm. and similar to what Harry was saying just about the student excitement, you know, there's, um, I do see a lot of excitement at, in these study groups with teachers really um, working on their inquiries together around digital literacy. So at a moment when, you know, the Common Core has these sort of digital literacies pieces in it that people really need to get their heads around or need, you know, are, are, are talking with some concern about, you know, needing to have, get their heads around, you know, is there a way that a course like this could support people in taking an inquiry approach to digital literacies and really sort of constructing something too that they could share about their practice and about what they're looking at. So I think it has just a lot of exciting potential and this idea of um, making stuff too in there, I think is pretty exciting. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that's it. Nice summary, thank you. Uh, anybody else wanna add to that? Shall we end there? It looks like it. Nobody's shaking their head. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's at, let's end there. I have one thing to say. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, please. Who's that? That's Paul. O. That's Fred. Oh, Fred. Fred, go ahead. No. So, um, just scanning the chat and and yeah. thinking about you know some which of these, will be um, posted with this, by the way. Go ahead. Yeah. Some of these challenges. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'll just throw this out there. I, I'm not sure that maybe the uniting factor or the umbrella interface, as it were, are the people. The, I mean, the guides that are just sort of pointing the way. And, and um, you know, as long as they're sort of in some place where they can be found, I don't know that it can't work that way. Yeah, I was feeling something similar, so that I'm glad you stated that. Thank you. Um, a couple of people that we want to recognize here at the end of our broadcast is Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, uh, because they got us started at edtechtalk.com and worldbridges.net. 
Um, thank you all, and thank you for being so patient. We have a lot of people on here tonight. Um, come back sometime when it's just a few of us, and we'll get deeper with you all. <laughs> but thank you all. Um, thank you. you thanks, time. Paul. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Yep, thanks. Good night, everyone. Good night.